by the Marine Society, the Aberdeen Medical Science Network, and also the Zoology and Biological Sciences Society. And uh, I'm very privileged this evening to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Helen Dooley. So Helen did her undergraduate degree here at Aberdeen University in genetics. She then went on to study an MSc and a PhD in antibody engineering. And she then moved to the US, if I'm correct, mm -hmm. and uh, worked at the uh, University of Maryland in uh, Baltimore at the School of Medicine there before coming uh, back to work at Pfizer as the principal research scientist. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And she's now back with us here at Aberdeen University where she's a senior uh, lecturer. Uh, Helen's research around uh, the possibility of using uh, shark antibodies for novel cancer uh, therapies received national uh, news coverage in 2013. And on behalf of all three societies, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Helen. Thank you. Wow, well thank you. I feel like I should leave now. I can't possibly top that. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's always nice to, to be able to get up and talk about your research, um, especially when, I've just pointed out to me, there's not many seats left. It's nice to have a nice, nice audience to talk to. Um, and yeah, so today I'm, I'm just going to kind of introduce you to my research. And what we're doing, there's a couple of different things. <coughs> feel free to interrupt and ask questions and if there's anything that you desperately want to know, I will try and answer it, but don't feel like you need to sit there and just listen to me ramble on for hours because I've had a lot of coffee today, I might do that. <laughs> um, I did actually put a slide in just about me and my history because I'm nosy and I like to know what other people have done. Um, and I think it's always interesting, so it sounds like you know this great planned out event, I went and I did you know my BSc and then my masters and then my PhD here and you know, it all sounds great and you guys probably sat there going, oh, I've got no idea what I'm going to do. I kind of accidentally fell into these. You get to the end of your bachelor's and you go, what am I going to do next? Oh, I'll do a master's. Well, what am I going to do at the end of that? Oh, there's a PhD, I'll do a PhD. Um, and I wound up working on sharks. I was doing my PhD in antibody engineering. And this is an honest to God true story. Um, it was supposed to be working on novel antibodies that they just found in camels. So camels have this weird antibody that only has you know, heavy chains and they thought these were the, the greatest new thing for, for diagnostics and for therapies. Um, and at that time I was, I was working with um, Bill Harris and Andy Porter and we immunized a load of camels that were out in Brunei. They were the Sultan of Brunei's non-racing camels. Um, and he allowed us to immunize them in collaboration with a group in Belgium. And I went to get my first samples, you know, I think I was about nine months into my PhD and the samples get shipped to me. Um, and I test them all and, and nothing's worked and I call the people, the collaborators in Belgium and say, oh, you know, none of these have worked, none of these animals have responded. And they said, oh, we've sent you the wrong ones, hang on. So always double check your samples when they come in. Um, so they go back to bleed the right camels and the camels had been rustled, they had been stolen. <laughs> um, so my immunized camels had been rustled in Brunei and I basically had to come up with a new project um, for my PhD nine months in. And at that point, a really cool paper had just come out about these novel antibodies in sharks. And I thought, OK, that's way cooler. Um, I want to work on that. Got in touch with the group in the US, which is the group that I, I wound up doing my postdoc with out in Baltimore and said, you know, I really want to work on this. And luckily, you know, I was naive enough not to realize that was not an appropriate thing to do because the guy in Baltimore, Martin Flanner, came back and was like, yeah, OK, we can, we can work something out. So I wound up doing my PhD on, on shark antibodies. Um, at the end of that, I went to work for a company for 12 months. And during that time, Martin, who I'd been working with, called me one day and he said, you know, what, like, what are you going to do next? You know, and in a moment of inspiration, I just turned around and said, well, I'm going to come work for you. And the phone goes really quiet and then he goes, yeah, OK, yeah, we can work that out. <laughs> um, so that's, that's basically how I got my postdoc. So if you don't ask, you don't get. Um, I wound up working in Baltimore for seven years, first of all as a postdoc and then um, as a research associate. Um, and it was at that point that kind of Fiz uh, Wyeth, as it was then, got interested in our shark antibodies as a potential therapeutic. And I was headhunted into the company to, to lead a group there um, on shark basic biology. Uh, Wyeth were taken over by Pfizer not long after that, and Pfizer not long after that decided to drop the program, and I was made redundant. So, exciting life. 
uh, on the dole, deciding what I wanted to do next. And really, it was just I wanted to get back to doing basic science and learning about more <coughs> about sharks and more about immune systems. And that's kind of how I wound up back here in Aberdeen. So it's all just been a kind of fortuitous accident. Um, I'm running my own lab here now as senior lecturer. So I've got two postdocs and three PhD students. I am recruiting a new PhD student for next year. Advert is on my website if anybody's interested. So that's kind of how I wound up here today. Um, I have three main things that I try and focus my work on, all kind of with sharks as a, a key component of them. Um, the first one is basically how did our immune system evolve? So how did the vertebrate immune system evolve? And if any of you have seen me lecture before, I talk about the human immune system is like a Ferrari. It is the Ferrari of immune systems. We have this wonderful, sleek, amazing immune system. Um, but it started off somewhere else, and, and sharks are kind of you know, a good comparison to, to be able to figure out how we got to the point that we, we got to. Um, secondly is whether we can use some of these novel molecules, like the antibodies, um, that we find in sharks to either prevent or cure human disease, or disease in other animals, or diagnose disease in other animals. So just basically, you know, if there are interesting molecules out there that other animals are using, can we make use of them as, as drugs? And the third thing, which I'm, I'm really also very much into, is um, how we can encourage people to help protect sharks. You know, you guys all know that they're massively at risk because of what we do to our oceans and what we do to these animals. So how can we actually instill this idea in people that sharks aren't big, jawsy, toothy type animals that are looking to eat you every time you get into the water? And we should actually be doing a better job of looking after them. So cartilaginous fish, this is what I work on mainly. Um, sharks, gates rays, and chimera. So all part of the same family. Um, chimera are usually the ones people haven't heard of. They're the most ancient sharks, usually pretty freaky looking deep sea guys, uh, like elephant fish and rabbit fish, things like that. Um, but when we think about the cartilaginous fishes, they basically fill almost every niche that's out there. We even get you know, freshwater stingrays and bull sharks that can go into freshwater. So um, really widespread uh, with lots of different life modes as well. So everything from basking sharks that are huge and eat plankton to little velvet belly lantern sharks that live in the dark. And then there are things like cookie cutters that live by, you know, that are about this big and they drill into animals and suck chunks of flesh off them. So, you know, every sort of mode of living that you can think of these guys use. Um, and this kind of sums up how I feel about them. You know, this, this book did, it's probably about the worst book out there for, for shark conservation, but there's one quote in it which I love, and it is that sharks have everything a scientist dream of. Um, and, and I literally do dream of them sometimes, you know, they're, they're great animals to work on. And if you do work with them, they, they are amazing animals. They're, they're really wonderful animals to work on. So um, some of you in the room will probably know they're also really ancient animals. So we think the first cartilaginous fish appeared about 450, 500 million years ago. Um, the Chimera, just talking about kind of things like elephant sharks, they diverged off that lineage about 350 million years ago. So if we look at a chimera and something like a great white, there's actually a massive distance between those two shark species. So this photo was taken by Alan in one of his deep sea excursions um, of an elephant shark. You can see like they, they are really freaky looking animals. Um, about 250, 200 million years ago, there were actually two mass extinction events. So there was one at the end of the Permian, which wiped out almost everything on the face of the Earth. Um, and then a second one around the uh, Triassic-Jurassic boundary, which is the one that did for the dinosaurs. Um, these guys made it through those and three other mass extinction events. You know, they, they, they've been around a very long time. They're very tough cookies. Um, today, we think, we don't know, that there's somewhere between 700 and 1,000 species. We're not even sure how many species of shark we've got. Um, you know, it seems like every other day somebody describes a new species. And I know recently they found, I think it was a freshwater, a new freshwater shark species. And, you know, they're constantly popping up with animals that they thought were extinct. They've just found one in some fish market somewhere in the, the Far East, which is good and worrying at the same time. 
Um, to put that into some sort of perspective, this is when the dinosaurs were about. So I know, at least in my mind, I think the dinosaurs were ages ago. These guys were around 250 million years before the first dinosaurs and survived the extinction event that wiped these guys out. So, you know, they are, they are really tough, tough little creatures. Um, the first kind of part of my work that I want to talk about is, is the much more fundamental part. So uh, I use these animals as a research model to understand how our, our immune system evolved, as in us as humans, how our immune system came about. Um, and the reason for that, even though we know that kind of immune systems go way back, you know, everybody, those people that in my first year lecture this morning, we're talking about how immune systems can be found in everything, including plants. Um, so immune systems go way back, but we only actually see kind of adaptive immune systems, immune systems that learn and can do better a second time and a third time um, when we get to the jawless fishes. And if we're looking for an immune system like you and I, the furthest that we can go back are the cartilaginous fishes. So they have things like you know, B cells and T cells, um, they have MHC. So it's fundamentally, going back to my, my uh, Ferrari analogy, if we're the Ferrari, they're the Model T Ford. So they're using all the same building blocks. They have you know, an engine, they have wheels, they have a steering wheel. It's just that it's a much simpler form. So we can kind of use that, figure out what the basics are, what the essentials are, and then scale up and add all these complexities that humans have to understand the human immune system a bit better. If you imagine opening up the engine of a Ferrari and trying to figure out what's going on, it's pretty complex. So we use this as a tool to understand that. So. When I first moved out to the US, um, it was kind of thought that sharks had this really poor immune response. You know, the first thing I did, it's like you guys, you get sent into the lab and you sit down and you read a ton of papers um, and you try and figure out what the prevailing thought is. And at the time, it was like sharks have this really crummy immune response. And I was looking through papers, you know, as far back. Come in, guys. No, no, please come in. As far back as kind of the 1940s and 50s and 60s. And Everybody was saying, oh, you know, we, we immunize them and they don't produce an immune response and, you know, their immune systems are really rubbish and there's no, no point studying these guys. And they were looking at antibody and they were saying, oh, you know, this antibody is just sticky, it's not really doing anything. And if we immunize them and then go back and look to see if there's a memory response, we don't really see anything, so they're not learning, they don't have an adaptive immune system, um, you know, they're, they're no good. And, you know, again, always question everything. I'm sat in my lab and I'm doing my strokey beard science and I'm saying, doesn't make sense. You know, to me coming in, these animals have been around for 450 million years, but they have a crummy immune system. Like, how, how does that add up? It doesn't add up. And you've got species that live for over 100 years, but they've got a crummy immune system. You know, it, it just didn't make sense to me. Um, so we came up, so Martin and I sat in the lab, we said, okay, this doesn't make sense, so we're going to you know, hypothesize that sharks actually do have a good immune system, but the things that people were doing previously to look at that were wrong. Basically, they were using the wrong tools, or they were doing the wrong sort of assays. You know, it makes much more sense if sharks have a good immune system, they're swimming about in our oceans for 450 million years, that we're wrong, not that their immune system is bad. Looking at the literature, that seemed to make sense as well. So, you know, we were scanning the literature and it seemed like every single group was using a different species of shark. So there was lots of work on lemon sharks and nurse sharks and, you know, but nobody's using the same species. Nobody's using the same methods. In some cases, you know, this, this is my favorite. I say experimental setup wasn't, wasn't great. Um, they were holding nurse sharks in a sea pen off the coast of Florida one of their immunized animals escaped during a hurricane on day 120 and was recaptured 40 days later and they just carried on with the experiment. <laughs> now, I have no clue. If anybody's been to Florida and seen nurse sharks swimming about how you tell one nurse shark from another nurse shark, but this was, you know, deemed perfectly appropriate and they just carried on with their study. You know, it's, it's like my favorite materials and methods. Um, and obviously, you know, these guys were working at a real disadvantage because they're working, you know, 1960s. There's no PCR, so you can't sequence genes. Um, they don't have monoclonal antibodies that hadn't been invented yet, so they don't really have any tools. Um, you know, they don't know a lot about immune molecules. The whole innate immune system hadn't been discovered yet, so, you know, they're, they're really working at um, a massive disadvantage. 
So we thought, okay, maybe we can do this better. Which is easier said than done, because if you're starting from nowhere, what do you do? You know, we're saying, okay, these guys did it all wrong. Okay, how do you do it right? So um, I was in the US, this study that we did wound up taking, I think three years to do this study, and probably the first two years of that was just optimization. You take a shark, you immunize it, you try and figure out what's going on. You realize that you've done it completely wrong. You take another shark, you immunize it. So even things like how much antigen do you give it? How often do you give it? You know, these aren't humans. You, do you boost them every two weeks? Do you boost them every four weeks? Do you boost them six months apart? Do you give them a lot of antigen? Not very much antigen. How do you do that? Like, where do you immunize them? You know, it's easy for us. You stick it in our arm. Do we do the same thing with them? Do we stick it in a fin? Do we stick it in a vein? Do, you know, so just working those things out. We had this really great idea that most animals you can immunize interperitoneally. So you basically just puncture into their body cavity and inject antigen. So you would do that with a bony fish. Great, we'll do that again. Did it with our first shark and then realized they have a little hole called a spiracle that they use to flush their body cavity with seawater. Mm -hmm. So you squirt the antigen in and it just squirts all back out all over you again. So not a, don't worry, don't worry. Not really a good strategy. So, so you know, we spent a long time just figuring out Okay, how do you actually <coughs> immunize a shark? How do you do it properly? Um, and the strategy we came up with, first shot in the fin, just like you and I go into the doctors, you give it a shot in the arm. Um, and then about every two to four weeks, we would take a blood sample, we would analyze that. Um, so just basically spin it down and do an ELISA and look at antibody levels. Um, and then every two to four weeks, we would, uh, every, sorry, every four weeks we would re-immunize the animal. So basically you're doing something every two weeks, so immunize, bleed, immunize, bleed. Um, and we would have to do that about four to six times, uh, mainly working on, well, working on uh, sharks in this instance. So we uh, had a really good collaboration there with the, the big aquarium in Baltimore, so we could keep, you know, these big, beautiful six-foot sharks to work with. Um, which is it's lucky they're really docile animals because pound for pound they're about three times stronger than, than you are. <coughs> so uh, it's good that generally they like to cooperate and they're pretty easy going animals because uh, if you're trying to wrestle them out of the tank and give them a shot and they don't want it, there can be a, a lot of fuss. So we would take those samples at the end of the immunization period and, and just do a, a straightforward ELISA on it and what we would see. So in this case, we're just using um, just a, a general protein that we could buy from Sigma lysozyme um, to show, you know, whether we were getting a response or not, nice and cheap and easy. Um, and what we would see is each bleed that we took after subsequent immunizations, you're getting this nice increase in binding. So already, you know, first kind of assay, we're showing that a lot of that data to begin with saying that sharks don't produce a good antibody response and they don't respond to antigens is wiped out in, in one fell swoop. They're obviously doing something good. And if we took a control, so just some other irrelevant antigen, and looked at bind into that, there's nothing there. So it's obvious that these sharks are responding to the thing that we've put into them, and it's not just some, some random response that we're measuring. Um, and what we actually learned over kind of this period, we worked with, I think, six different animals we tried this with, and we saw if you were immunizing them for the first time, you took a completely naive animal out of the tank and you started to immunize it. Normally it would take about four shots, about four to six months, um, dependent on whether it was summer or winter, um, to see some sort of immune response. And that immune response was based in this kind of um, antibody ice type. So it's uh, monomeric IgM and IgNR. Um, so you would get this really nice specific response within four to six months to the antigen that you were putting in. Um, the really exciting bit for us um, is that when we looked at that antibody and we really looked, assessed the quality of the antibody, um, how good it was at binding to its target, we saw that the quality of the antibody increased as well. So what you could see was that this affinity maturation is going on. It's what we see in our immune responses is that over the course of immune response, so if you get flu, you produce a really poor response for the first couple of days. And then as your immune system starts to refine that response, you get a much, much kind of stronger and better response. And that's how you clear the virus or whatever. Um, and we were seeing exactly the same thing in these guys, which was the first time this had been shown. 
we also showed that if you go back then to that animal, so we, we actually waited, we wanted to wait for the antibody levels to drop and we went away and we started taking samples every couple of months and waiting for this antibody to, to disappear so that we could boost them again. So the same way as you would you know, go to your doctor, get your prime and then go back and get your boost so that you've got protection for a couple of years if you're going off to some uh, exotic country. We were waiting to do the same thing with these animals. Um, and it took well over a year for the antibody titers to come down, which was a lot longer than we expected. So, you know, every month I will be sat in the lab going, damn it, like we can't do this again. Um, so we took a lot of time waiting for this to come back down. It was worth it though. We waited for it to drop away so that we didn't see this binding anymore. And then we just gave them one more boost um, and we gave that IV so there wouldn't be any kind of um, extra stimulation and within a month the antibody levels had come back up again. So again they're showing this really good memory response which is exactly the same as you and I would do you know, when we go to get our flu shot or our hepatitis shot or whatever at the doctor's. So with this study we overthrew a lot of the data that was out there that said sharks have a crummy immune response. So we showed that they've got affinity maturation, we showed that they've got memory. Essentially we showed they share exactly the same features of adaptive immunity as humans. So in this one study, which I presented in about five slides, but was actually you know, seven good years work, um, uh, we, we overthrew a lot of that old data saying, you know, sharks have this crummy immune response. Now they have a really good immune response. We were just looking at it wrong. We were looking at it, you know, um, without good tools and without good protocols. So like all good science, we get one answer and what it does is just generate a whole load more questions. That's what science does, it gives you answers. It gives you one answer and about 20 more questions. So we know now that sharks produce a really good immune response, but it takes four months to get it. So what protects them in the meantime? How are they defending themselves? Um, how do they initiate that immune response? How's it regulated? How do these animals not blow themselves apart when they're responding to things? So all these just come up more and more questions that now we, we want to answer. Ooh. There is a red light flashing. <laughs> it was the Jaws picture, it killed it, man. <laughs> Sometimes if you flick it off and flick it back on. Mm -hmm. oh. We've got a green light, so everybody cross your fingers. Grand. I was busy in the midst of all these complicated questions. Um, yeah, so we kind of got to this point where it's like, okay, we've, we have one answer, but now we, we have a whole load more questions. Um, and it was about this time that I moved back to the UK and I started my group up here. Aberdeen is not the place to keep six foot tropical nest <laughs> sharks. You might have noticed the weather isn't so great here. Um, so we had to switch our model species. Um, I did want these guys, but there isn't room in our aquarium for them. So instead, I got these guys. They're ferocious. Don't, don't even laugh. This is my guys in a feeding frenzy. They're so excited. Um, so we're working on small spotted cat sharks now. Um, much smaller, much easier to handle. Much more suited to an Aberdeen climate. You can go and fish them off Nig Bay if you're, you're good at fishing. 
Um, so we can keep them much easier here. Um, that brought in its own problems because obviously we don't have tools and things set up for these, but they are, are much easier to keep. Um, because we don't have tools, the first thing we decided to do was try and get some sequence. Um, the only sequence that's out there at the minute for um, a cartilaginous fish is the elephant shark genome, really, um, which was produced in uh, 2014. Um, but I said at the beginning, these guys are chimeras. So they're about 350 million years separated from these guys. Uh, that isn't, it, it's reasonably useful information, but it's not great. So, you know, even, you know, if we're looking at nurse shark that I worked on before and spotted cat shark, 200 million years distance. So that's the equivalent of looking at humans and maybe chickens or something like that. Like it's a big distance. Um, so we can't expect these things to be, to be alike. So the first thing we decided to do was try and get some sequence for cat shark so that we could work with that. Um, so we took our little guys and we harvested a whole load of different tissues made some good quality RNA from it, and then cDNA, and we normalized that. So that was important because we're using all these different tissues. So if you think about you know, something like pancreas, you've got a whole load of enzymes there, but you've got loads and loads of them in high amounts and some in, in, not very, you know, in, in lower amounts. Um, so we use this normalization procedure basically to degrade the things that are there in really high amounts so that we would get really good coverage. And we use lots of tissues because all we're interested in is as much information as we can possibly get. Um, and then we sequence the heck out of it. Um, from that, we got uh, over 135 million sequence reads. And when we assemble that, so I have a, I'm really lucky to have a bioinformatician as a PhD student, so he assembled it for me. Um, we think that of the transcriptome, we have about 98% coverage of genes that are full length. Um, and if we look for anything um, at all, 100% of things that we've looked for, we can find it at least as partial sequence. So we've got a starting point. Um, you can't even imagine. So when I was doing my postdoc, sometimes trying to clone a gene and trying to do it by homology cloning, you could take 18 months if it was a difficult gene to try and clone. So now just being able to go to a database and say, oh, I want this gene, bing, oh look, there it is. It's like, you know, it's like a completely different planet. Um, it makes our work a lot easier. And what it means is that we can simply go in and we can just mine for any gene that we're interested in. So one of the projects that we've got ongoing at the minute, um, some of my students in the lab that are actively working on this for their honors project. So we're interested in how immune system is regulated, how things are initiated, so we're looking at immune signaling molecules. And we're looking mainly at things like cytokines, so uh, TNF superfamily molecules, um, that are helping regulate the immune system and they're starting to trigger this immune response. So you get pathogen, first thing is cells start to secrete these signaling molecules to alert the immune system that there's something wrong. And they're bound by, by cell surface receptors that then initiate some sort of response, whether it's cells developing in different ways or moving to different places or having some sort of effector function. Basically, this is how the immune system is, is regulated. And we, we know it pretty well how it works in humans, but how does it work in sharks? Um, one of the examples, which is a really, really nice example, is um, in terms of like B cell survival and development. So, you know, we want to know how these guys are responding. We want to know how they produce an antibody. So we want to know more about the cells that are doing that. How are the B cells surviving? How are they <coughs> developing? Um, and in humans, this is, again, pretty well worked out. Um, so there are two cytokines called April and BAF. Um, and they bind in different degrees to three different receptors. And dependent on the binding of which cytokine it is and which receptor it is, it tells the cell to do different things. So I think April is more important early in cell development, and then BAF is important much later on when you're actually producing a response. So it's kind of the balance of these things that are important for immune control. Um, and we know that if you get dysregulation of this, um, it's implicated in human diseases like arthritis and lupus and things like that. So it is really important for keeping this balance in the immune system and how much antibody is produced. So we thought, great. Really good place to start where you know, we know what happens with the antibody, how do the B cells control things. So we go in and we look for these molecules in shark, thinking it's going to be exactly the same because you know, that's what the literature tells us. These things are conserved right across vertebrates um, and get a few surprises. So the first surprise we get is 
There's no longer two cytokines, there's three. There's another one, there's an additional one called BOM, which isn't present in mammals. So, okay, three cytokines, three receptors, great, except one of the receptors is missing as well. So now instead of having two cytokines and three receptors, we've got three cytokines and two receptors, and no clue at all how this works. So, again, like all good science, we've answered one question, and now we've, you know, graduated to another one. How does this work? It becomes even more interesting if we actually look across all the different vertebrate groups and look at these receptors. So we look at BAF receptor. Gets there in mammals. There's one paper that says it's there in chickens. Great. Uh, we know it's not there, or we think it's not there. We hope it's not there. Harry's going to tell me when he clones out his gene later today. Um, uh, we think it's not there in cartilaginous fishes. Uh, we don't think it's there in bony fishes. We're not sure about reptiles and amphibians. Um, so this is one of the things we're looking into now is like, it could be that this receptor that is really, really important for mammalian B cell development only actually appeared pretty late in evolution of the immune system. So it only maybe appeared in birds and mammals. It wasn't there at the beginning. It's an add-on. So going back to our Ferrari analogy, you know, it's your spoilers or your leather seats or whatever. It's not actually a fundamental part like the wheels and the engine. Um, and this other molecule bomb, that seems to have been there at the beginning in cartilaginous and bony fishes and then has been lost. But we're looking now to see at which point it's being lost. So again, is this an add-on? Is this something just that these guys have? Or is it something that they've, you know, it was fundamental, but it's somehow been compensated for maybe by having a new receptor. So this is the sort of thing that having this data at either end allows us to do is understand when things arrived and whether they're add-ons or whether they're fundamentals in the immune system. Uh, Bath bomb and April come from a massively huge family, so uh, don't worry about this, but this is just all the different groups of those. Somebody did a really nice analysis of it in bony fish recently, um, and another student in my lab has been going through trying to figure out if we can find these in shark as well. So how many of these were there right at the beginning of the, the evolution of vertebrate immunity? Um, and the answer is quite a lot. Um, so there are you know, quite a lot of these that we can find in shark that we can say, okay, they were there at the beginning, they're important. Um, and then these other things, you know, we can look at and we can say, okay, are they add on later? Are they just in mammals? Are they just in, you know, did they appear in reptiles or did they appear later on? What's, what's there at the beginning? Um, we've also got a, a series of projects ongoing to look at things like interferons, which we know in humans stop the spread of viruses, things like that. So we're looking at those things in, in sharks to see what repertoire of interferons they've got, what different type of interferons they've got. Um, we're looking at the complement system, which is basically the first line of defense against bacterial infection to see if that's the same. Um, the data that we have from that says that it's very different in sharks to humans. So we can really look now and start to dissect these things out and see what's, you know, what is essential. Okay, I'm going to have a quick swig of water, so if there are any questions, now is a good time. No? Right, I'll crack on. Second interest <coughs> is whether we can use some of the novel molecules we come across to prevent or cure human diseases. And this kind of carries on from the work that I started in my PhD. Um, so like I said, uh, about that time, this paper came out by Greenberg um, and the group that I wound up with, um, Martin Flanick's group out in, at that point they were in Miami, um, who were looking at antibodies in sharks and had just come across this new antibody um, which didn't have any heavy chains. So basically, our antibodies, human antibodies, have two heavy chains, two light chains, and you need all of those to make this, this antibody binding site. Um, and with this, they didn't, have any other chains, so the binding site was thought to be just this little molecule at the top, you know, and immediately we think, hang on, there's a single domain there which is going to make it more stable, and it's really small, so it might be useful for something. Um, so it was at that point that I'd contacted Martin's team and convinced them to uh, give me a lot of RNA from their sharks to start building um, libraries from these and look at the antibody binding. So this is what I was talking about, so in humans, this is kind of the portion that you need to bind to targets of the antibody, but in sharks, these IgNR molecules, it's much, much smaller. So, you know, you can use that. You think about all the different uses. 
Um, because it's much smaller, we thought that it might fit into different spaces, things like that. Because it's a single domain, it's going to be much more sturdy. So we kind of had these ideas about what we would expect. Um, it turns out this molecule is uh, really stable. Um, this is kind of the structure that we solved, um, I think in, God, I don't know now, a couple of years back now, um, in collaboration with a group in Scripps in California. Um, but it also has what we realized has lots of disulfide bonds, so that makes it extra stable. Um, so this is where we started out in about uh, 2001, 2000. We took a shark and we immunized it we just with, with lysozyme, and then we would take blood samples and isolate the, the B cells from that, prep some RNA, and then basically just use PCR to amplify out all of these binding regions for this isotype clone them into a phage display vector where you get little bacteria phage and you get your antibody displayed on the surface. And it kind of works as a, a pseudo B cell because you've got this linkage of the gene inside the phage and then the, the antibody on the surface. So you're selecting for, for function and the gene at the same time. And then you basically go through this these rounds of uh, selection, which we call panning. If you think about it, it's like gold panning. You're looking for these little specks of gold or your binding molecules in amongst all the other crap that's there that the sharks responded to in the past. So you would take those bacteriophage with the antibodies, you would amplify them, select on antigen, um, wash to get rid of any rubbish that's in there, um, and then elute things that were specific for your target and just keep going through that process. Um, and what we saw, which was nice, was that you started to see this increase in the number of binding clones specific for the target, which is what we were kind of expecting if you're getting these things that are binding. I mean, at the time we started this, we didn't, we didn't realize this would work at all. We, didn't, we weren't even 100% sure that these things were antibodies, to be honest, but it was just one of those, like I said, as a naive student, you're like, this is great, I want to do this. And later on, I'd be like, you know, this is really... Like if my student came to me now, I'd be going, oh, this is a bad idea. You don't want to do this. Um, yep, so we managed to get binders to our target, to lysozyme, and these are the kind of the crystal structures of the molecules that we got. And the first thing that we realized, um, lysozyme is an enzyme. And uh, what we realized is that our antibodies were actually binding into the active site of that enzyme. So the blue bit is you know, normally where lysozyme would bind to its target and cleave it. So you're thinking about you know, bacteria lysis and things like that. So it would clip it in this area. And our antibody was basically binding directly into that, that area. Um, this is just the different, two different um, antibodies that we managed to pull out of our library. And they both targeted this, this active site cleft. Um, if you're a drug company or somebody like that, you're really excited about this because if you can inhibit enzymes, it's a really good thing. Um, we tested the stability of them, so we had this idea that they would be you know, pretty stable. Um, even I didn't anticipate is that you can hold them at 50 degrees for three hours. They do perfectly fine, still 100% effective. Um, you can actually boil them for three hours and you'll still get some binding at the end of it. Um, so, you know, again, if you're a drug company or a diagnostics company, you're really excited by this sort of thing. Um, and we did show that, you know, if we incubate uh, without, so we incubate lysozyme and bacteria that you get a certain rate of lysis, and then if we introduce our antibody is that you can actually decrease that rate. So they are targeting the active site and they're inhib in inhibiting enzyme function. So all really exciting things. Um, and at that point, we actually patented the process of immunizing sharks and making antibodies. I've uh, got a worldwide patent on that, which is, I don't even know how many times it's been licensed now, but yeah, a lot of, lot of interest out there in these molecules. Um, like I said, small, stable, bind target, high speci specificity, uh, can be raised against these hard to hit targets like enzyme active sites, um, and bind in very different ways to conventional like mouse or human antibodies. So once we'd finished kind of the lysozyme study, um, our data went out there and I was working in the US at this point and I was approached by a combination of the US and UK defense agencies who at that point, you know, this is the era of George Bush, the war on terror. Um, everybody's pretty scared because people are sending anthrax through the post. Um, and they came to me because they were looking for new diagnostics that are highly stable to be able to detect anthrax and Ebola. Um, 
the big problem with a lot of these kits is that you know they would put them together. They were based on human antibody, uh, mouse antibodies at the time, and they would put the kit together, and then they would ship it off somewhere, so out to Sudan or wherever, um, and over the course of it being shipped, if it was exposed to any changes in temperature, by the time it got there, it was no good and it would get thrown in the bin. Um, so they would have to maintain cold chain all the way out to these countries, uh, which is really expensive and kind of inconvenient if you're in a war zone. Um, so they were trying to alleviate this necessity. They were looking for things that are highly stable and resistant to temperature changes and very specific. So uh, we seem to have a winner. Uh, so we took our sharks. We immunize them with inactivated Ebola virus. You do not want to see the health and safety forms that you have to fill in <laughs> to immunize a shark with Ebola virus. It is not fun. Um, but we got it through. We did it. Immunized the sharks. Got really nice responses um, to the virus. Uh, took our blood samples, generated the antibody libraries, selected for clones. Um, and then we picked a couple of clones that, that we looked at. So this is just the data from one clone. Um, we knew that they bound, so we generated a lot of protein. We shipped that back to uh, Port and Down in the UK. They did a lot of uh, neutralization assays with Ebola. It was very exciting. Um, and what they showed was that, you know, we raised our antibody against Ebola Zaire, was that it could bind to that but it also bound uh, reasonably well to a couple of the other strains of Ebola virus that are out there. Um, not so good to, I'm going to try and say it, Bundabugio. Um, but it, it could recognize a lot of different strains. So we had a really good diagnostic that is, you know, nice and uh, specific, but can actually pick up, you know, a, I think four of the five different um, Ebola strains that are out there. The really exciting data was when we looked at the mouse antibody that they were using at the time for their kits, um, a thermo stability. So, you know, this thing basically crapped out once you got it beyond 60 degrees, didn't see any binding anymore. Um, and we looked at our shark antibody and it keeps on trucking 70 degrees and you're even going to get, you know, about 50% detection at 80 degrees. So our guys are much more stable than the, uh, the mouse antibodies they were using at the time. So this is kind of, I, th I think, I hope. Now we handed off then to um, guys at the Ministry of Defense and I'm hoping this is being developed into some sort of cool diagnostic. So you can imagine if you, you know, the situation that arose in 2014 where you want to be detecting people, you want to be able to monitor people and detect new cases of Ebola as quickly as possible and isolate people. You need exactly this sort of thing where you've got really fast detection. Um, you don't, you know, if you looked at the conditions out there, you don't want to have to keep these things in a fridge, stuff like that. So really useful diagnostics. Um, the second project, which is one that we're working on at the minute, is actually therapeutics for human disease. Again, you know, we think these things combine to different targets and different epitopes to antibodies that are out there at the minute. Um, and we decided to try this on a couple of cancer targets, and that's not because sharks don't get cancer. So sharks do get cancer. Um, it's just that people don't pay attention usually to sharks, I guess. Um, but there's definitely been reports of kind of melanomas and lymphosarcomas and things like that. So people are really, you know, I guess what happens most of the time is these guys get cancer and they die really quickly and then they get eaten by their mates so we don't see them. Um, but there are definite reports, especially coming from aquariums for, you know, captive animals that, that you do see cancers in sharks. But we thought, you know, it's a, it's a good place to kind of start and we wanted something, a system that, that is actually known pretty well and we already have antibodies out there that bind to these targets so that we can do a cross comparison the same as we did with the Ebola you know is there an antibody out there that we can compare with and see if we do have better or different binding um, so we chose this family the EGFR family um, epidermal growth factor receptors um, <coughs> basically four members of this family uh, one two three and four um, and they kind of come in different confirmations so her one her three and her four are in this closed conformation until they pair with something. So they have a ligand that activates them and that kind of opens them up and then they can pair with another partner. Um, her two is different because it's always locked in this open conformation. It doesn't need a, a ligand. Um, her two, so I guess um, maybe 
15, 20 years ago, they realized that a lot of kind of breast cancers and things like that are what they call HER2 positive. So uh, if you get an amplification in this gene, which is seen in a lot of breast cancers, so instead of having one copy, you would have like 10 copies, then the gene is overexpressed on the surface of the cell. You get you know, much more of this out there, so much more of it pairing up, and it signals into the cell, and it basically tells the cell to grow too much and divide too much. So you normally have HER2 on the surface of your cells. You just have a low level of it, which keeps your cells ticking over. In this case, because there's a gene amplification, you have much more. So the cells tick over much quicker, and basically you get kind of a cancerous growth. Um, there was a drug that was uh, licensed quite a few years ago, Herceptin, which actually stops HER2 from, from binding to one another. So when you've got HER2 positive cancer, they would uh, treat you with Herceptin. That antibody blocks the HER2 molecules from coming together. Um, it's really good for about six months. Um, so it gives people you know, a really good quality of life. It knocks back cancers, things like that. And then what they realize tends to happen is because you're reducing expression through HER2, suddenly you get upregulation of HER3. Um, so you're almost selecting for these HER3 high cells now. HER3 can also pair with HER2, um, and it signals much, much more strongly. So by treating with Herceptin, you know, you're giving patients a lot of extra time, but what you do is increase the chances that they're going to go into relapse six months later and they're going to get metastatic tumors to their brains and things like that. So this is a, a really bad situation. Um, once people realized this, they started trying to target this pairing, um, the HER2, HER3 pairing. And in the last year, this, this drug, Pajeta, which is also an antibody that blocks this pairing, has just been, been licensed. So we thought, OK, you know, can we, can we kind of mimic this? Can we try and get things that are comparable to this or better than these two, Hercept and Pajeta, by using our shark system? Um, so we took both of these proteins and we've immunized sharks with them, HER2 and HER3. Um, again, just using our standard protocol, so we would immunize in the fin and then we would boost and we were getting really nice responses to um, our target proteins. We are in the process of selecting out clones from libraries and things like that and I'm afraid because all this money is, uh, all this project is paid for by a cancer charity. The hope is if we find something really cool, we might be able to patent it, they might be able to do something with it. So. This is all I can say about this project at the minute, but yeah, watch this space or watch the news. Hopefully if we get something, we'll get, get back on the news. So the reason we got on the news was when we got the funding for this project, they made me go swim with the sharks in Queens Ferry Aquarium and they had all the press lined up there and you could tell, you know, I'm in the tank, in the suit, you know, yeah, wave away. You could tell everybody behind the glass was going, bite her, just bite her. You know, everybody's praying that there's gonna be some hideous accident and they can get it on the news. <laughs> it's bad. Okay, final thing. Um, the other thing I'm really interested in, you know, th like I said, I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with these animals and we're doing a lot of damage to them. So how, come, how can I actually use my work or how can I use my knowledge to try and encourage people to, to protect them? Um, you know, I, d I don't know, it kind of depresses me is when, you know, March, March 2014, 100 million sharks pulled out of the water annually. I mean, phenomenal numbers. Um, beginning of 2014, the um, IUCN basically put out a report to say that a quarter of sharks and rays are threatened with extinction. Um, what's not in this little headline is that we also are data deficient for a quarter of those animals. So probably, you know, there's a lot more animals in, in threat of extinction that we don't know about. And like I said, you know, we're, we're pulling animals out that we've never even seen before and the first time you see them is in a fish market. So you know, there's a big worry that we're gonna wipe them out before we even know about them. So I figure, okay, what's the best way to, to tackle this in my little way? Um, and I think the best way to tackle this in my little way is to talk to kids. So they are really are, you know, they are you of the future. They are our ambassadors. They're the guys that are going to be uh, looking after our oceans in, in the future. So I do a lot of these events where I'm going out and I'm talking to kids about, especially Scotland sharks. You would be amazed how many people do not realize that we have sharks in our waters. 
Um, and then you say to them, no, you know, we do. And they're like, oh, like Jaws. Like, no, not like Jaws. Um, so I go to a, a lot of kind of schools or uh, public engagement events or these sort of things and talk to little kids about sharks. And especially we, we do this thing called Scotland Super Sharks, um, where we give our native sharks kind of superhero characteristics. And we talk to them about, you know, how blue sharks are like the flash and they can swim really speedy or how velvet belly lantern sharks glow in the dark and how cool is that and really introduce them to, to different sharks and um, show them egg cases and things like that and how they can tell what shark came from what egg case. Um, we did this, this awesome thing at a school down in Montrose recently where we had a sand pit with little metal fish buried and then a kid's metal detector and they had to find the fish, they had to use their shark super sensors, like Spidey Sense, to find the fish in the thing, and then if they found the fish for the, the shark to eat, then they got a prize of some sweets. Um, I know that was a success, because when we ran out of the sweets, the kids were still coming back to play. <laughs> so uh, that was a definite winner that we'll do again. Um, so, I mean, it, I think it's really, it is really good to talk to them, because most of, there's two reactions when you talk to a five-year-old about sharks. It's like, oh, you know, do you like sharks? Um, the answer first is like, no, they bite, so you can kind of talk to them. Um, the other extreme of that is the kid that can then go, yeah, you know, what's your favorite shark? And they list off like 800 different species that you've never even heard of because they're so obsessed. Um, but I figure if we can get them engaged in this sort of thing now, you know, like I said, then as we, you know, as they, they grow up and they're, they're in this situation where they're making choices, then, then they're more informed and they hopefully will, will help protect our animals um, in the water. So we did this Scotland Super Sharks. Um, at the last event as well, we had this thing where they all had to colour a shark in. I love this just because it's, it's so cool. Um, they had to colour a shark in and they, they were friendly sharks, so they could colour them in whatever colours they want. So we had, you know, this is kind of nine o'clock in the morning. They had to pin it to the board around Scotland. So they had to refill Scotland seas with, with friendly sharks. Um, and this was about nine o'clock. And then we got to about lunchtime as the middle one. So we're starting to fill up. And by four o'clock, we didn't actually have any Scotland left. It was just <laughs> shark. It was pure shark. And, and they were dripping down the wall. And, um, but it's really awesome to kind of get them involved in that and get them, you know, we've got, I, I need to figure out now what I'm going to do with the sharks. We've got all these really cool sharks with eyelashes and <laughs> rainbow tails and everything. But I mean, these are the sort of kids that you're talking to, you know, little tiny kids. If you guys look this happy when I give a lecture, I'd be really pleased. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like these little ones, when we first started talking to them, you know, what, you know, do you, you know, do you like sharks? No, they're scary. And, you know, by the end of it, I'd managed to convince them that uh, velvet belly lantern sharks were the coolest animals on the face of the earth. So um, these are the sort of people that we want to get to. But obviously, you're going and you're doing these events and you're talking to, you know, at most, I think this is the most kids I've ever spoken to in one day, and it was 120 kids. And I know that because I counted my sharks and I got each one of them to do a shark. Um, so how do you reach a bigger audience? Um, so I came up with this idea of talking to, to um, a group of people that I was working with on, on a uh, training course. Um, we came up with this idea of play to promote. And we decided to try and come up with a video game that we could either give out to schools or you know, give us an app or something like that that will obviously entertain kids, it's fun. Um, but is educational, will educate them about sharks, um, and is very positive about sharks. So, you know, there are no, we looked at video games, and most of the video games out there are great whites chasing swimmers, and you have to swim away, or you're the great white, and you have to eat the people. Um, they're not very positive uh, things about sharks. Um, this is my team. Really, I'm so excited about this. Um, this is my team, so they've called themselves Benthos Games. These guys are honours students at Abate, so they're all honours students in uh, game design or um, coding or producing, things like that. Um, and for their honours project, we've given them this, this play to promote project. Um, they're going to come up with a video game which we're calling Shark Life. Um, they're all looking, they were really upset with me because I asked them for a photo and they don't like this photo. Um, but I told them I wanted to talk about this today. Um, yeah, so these guys are in the process for their honours project. By the end of the year, hopefully, we're going to have a prototype video game that we can kind of trial on people, hopefully kids as well, 
Um, and then once we've got that prototype, try and get a games company involved to, to do something bigger and better so we can reach a lot more kids um, with this idea of, of being positive about sharks. Um, at the minute, we're working on kind of a Windows PC-based thing aimed at 7 to 12-year-olds. And the idea is, is that as you progress through the levels, you have to save as many sharks as you can. And each shark you encounter, you get information on and you can file it in your shark deck. So anybody who's played Pokemon and you've got your Pokedex, yeah? So we're going to do that. That's your standalone app. You get to save, save these things. Uh, the twist in the story is you are a shark yourself. So we decided my cat sharks are so cool. You know, you as the player are going to be the shark and it's going to be your job to avoid... Um, kind of natural threats, but also to avoid things like man-made threats and save your buddies around you from, you know, dredges and pollutants and, and things like that. So really kind of try and um, engage, engage kids in, you know, empathizing and, and be the shark, be the shark. My new mantra. Uh, this is the very first view of this game. Hopefully we're going to have something by the end of the year, but this is going to kind of be the sort of thing that our shark swims through. Um, if you do not succeed in saving sharks, what will happen is this will become grayer and more boring and animals will start to disappear. So we're really going to try as well as kind of reflect the idea if you start to take these top predators out, the world becomes a, a much more boring and not exciting place. Um, I would encourage you, if you're on Twitter, follow at Benthos Games, keep up to date with what we're doing. Um, I'm hoping at some point I might give a little spiel once we've got the game going or pull people in and get some some testers and see what's going on but that essentially is what i'm doing um big thank you to people i've worked with in the past all the people in my lab honor students that are doing a fabulous job this year and generating lots of data for me and people that pay me to do it so and on that note i'm happy to take questions I don't do anything against anybody. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, it's just, I mean, un unless you're involved in policy, it's really difficult to influence that sort of stuff. You know, and, and definitely, um, I was out in, in Hong Kong uh, quite a few years back, um, and what you see there, you know, is the whole shark's fin soup thing, is the older generation is still very ingrained in this idea, you know, the shark's fin soup, it's, you know, it's really, it's about kudos. I mean, this stuff is vile. It looks vile. Um, from what I've heard, it doesn't taste very good either. But it's all about the kudos that you can afford that stuff. But if you talk to the younger generation, they're really now starting to get this idea that it's not cool. Um, and, you know, you talk to younger, you know, teenagers and things like that, they will say, oh, you know, no, we wouldn't eat shark's fin soup. So I think that's really how you target it. Those, the guys that are longlining and finning and things like that are never going to stop doing that unless there is no market. Um, and I think that's the real way, way to do this, and it's, it's kind of through education. Um, in terms of bycatch and things like that, again, you know, it's just about making people aware that the damage that it does and you know, picking their seafood more carefully and things like that. And again, I, I, think, I mean, I don't know. I don't know a better way, but I think education, if you educate people, then they can at least make better choices. If they choose not to do that, that's fine, but you know, at least they have the information. Everybody just too hot. Um, so your public engagement work is really interesting. How would you encourage students to get involved with public engagement, especially targeting uh, younger adults in this? So things like May Festival and, um, you know, there's always, people are always looking for people to go into schools and talk to kids about stuff. So, you know, even if it's like your local primary school, you say that you, you know, if they're having some sort of science event, you know, I'll come along and I'll set up a stall talking about, you know, even just fish. Like we went and did a thing at Explorathon where it was just kids colouring in fish for our happy fish farm. Um, if you can get kids to colour in, they, they love it. And you the thing is, is, as they're colouring in, you can sit with them and you can talk to them. Um, the really interesting thing is quite often you will be sat, you know, I'll be sat talking to a 
six year old or something while you know I, I usually join in with the colouring it's about my level um, so we'll both be sat and we'll be colouring a shark in and I'll be talking about sharks and from behind you you will hear a parent say I didn't know that did you know that like blah 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 you know so what you're doing is not only are you educating the kid kind of the parents are listening in and picking up stuff as well so you know I think if you can get involved in anything like that or volunteer to go into a school and talk about science for a day or you know that we're always looking for volunteers for May Festival and um, yeah and it's it, to be honest it's really good fun like dealing with little kids you'll, you'll never get a better audience than little kids because they are so excited about everything it doesn't matter what you show them they're like oh my god that's amazing you know um, so it really kind of brings back to you it's like you know sometimes it's easy to forget when you're in a lab and you've just done your 800th PCR that hasn't worked you know science science is boring it's like but you talk to these little kids and they're so excited about it it's like oh actually I, I have quite a cool job um, so it's it's nice to do that yeah and they're, they're good fun and you you get you get some of the best questions off little kids they're just you know I've had whole conversations with them about whether I know their grandmas and <laughs> you just never know what they're going to talk about next so um, it's always good fun so I would totally yeah I would totally recommend and it looks great on your CV you know I mean this is the thing it's great you know it's good to do science and it's good to be a student and stuff but if you're actually able to go and take that knowledge and, and impart it to somebody else it really it's another skill it shows people um, good fun any other questions everybody's desperate to go home <laughs> for their tea you know where I am, I'm happy, stop me in a corridor, ask me questions, send me emails, it's all good. But thank you so much for, for coming along tonight. Thank you.